Hello, my name is Greg Barraza. I'd like to thank you for uh, watching my presentation. I wish I can be uh, in person, as I'm sure most of us have the same wish. But since times are the way they are now, and th this is the next best thing, I suppose. So I'd like to discuss with you uh, my study that I did with long-term incarcerated juveniles. Um, my, the, the study was providing post-secondary academic academia to long-term incarcerated juveniles. And the purpose of this particular study was twofold. The first purpose was to really change the perception of academia with incarcerated juveniles. The second was to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. And I'll give you a little story on, on, on why we were doing what we were doing. There was one day when I was talking with the director of probation and we were outside of juvenile hall. We were just having a conversation and I was looking at juvenile hall and I was looking at the men's jail, which is adjacent to juvenile hall. And I asked him, I said, hey, um, what do we do to stop our kids from going from juvenile hall to the men's jail? What can we do to stop this little transition? Because they, they only have to travel less than a city block to get there. And he looked at me, he's a very direct and stoic man. And he looked at me and he said, you're the academic, you figure it out. And so I took that both as a suggestion and as a challenge. So a couple of days later, I went up to him again. And this time we're inside juvenile hall. And I said, would you be opposed to me starting a college? for our students who have graduated. And he told me, not at all. Whatever you need, let me know. That's how the ball got rolling. Because I knew that students, long-term incarcerated students had a particular perception of academia based on my 25 years experience of working with secondary, uh, sec within the secondary system of, of uh, juvenile justice education. So, my, so I, I, I began this particular program, my colleague and I began this program with the purpose of changing that particular perception. Right. They all have had negative academic experiences. And I want I theorize that if we change that academic experience. Then it will change their perception of academia. So we had to look at. The framework, we had to look at how we are going to to look and, and to look at their educational experience. And we had to make sure that we did not fall into that same pattern that they had experienced. And so the first theoretical framework that that we looked at was culture responsive teaching and culture responsive teaching is. Says that we should understand and know. The lives of our students. And our curriculum should reflect that. Now, because I've had 25 years of experience in juvenile justice education, I understood and I knew juvenile justice education from the teaching standpoint. I did not know it from the student standpoint. I just knew it as a teacher. So I had to learn what it was like to be a student in juvenile justice education in, in juvenile hall, essentially. Um, and that became known to not only me, but to all 
the the um, my my colleagues who visited and, and all of our visitors, you know, that was known throughout discussion. We talked with our students. What is it like? What if we gave you this? So we began to know their experience. The other part of our culture responsive teaching uh, theoretical framework is that we understood that all of our students were from a lower SES. So they were from essentially students of poverty and how that played a role in their negative academic experience. So we took culture responsive teaching and we started to design our curriculum to revolve around what is known as culture responsive teaching. The second theoretical uh, framework that, that we, we, we used was uh, critical pedagogy. And critical pedagogy um, kind of surfaced, and, and, and it seems so obvious to use critical pedagogy during this study because we had to look at the educational practices in juvenile justice education. We had to look at how were these students being taught, not only in juvenile hall, but even prior to juvenile hall. In other words, what led them to incarceration, right? What led them to begin the school to prison pipeline? And of course, the data show higher suspension rates, higher expulsion rates for our students of color and for our particular study, we found that 98% of incarcerated juveniles have been suspended and or expelled at, at one point in their academic career. So it's not uncommon for them to be suspended or expelled. So it's not uncommon for them to have negative academic experiences. Moreover, most of these students consistently failed their classes. In other words, it was F after F after F after F. So for them, the idea of academia or the idea of school was really a negative idea and it was a negative trigger. So we look at that critical pedagogy lens and we, we want to turn it around. We wanted to give these students a negative academic experience at the same time, providing them with a university-driven education because I knew they could perform at the university level. I knew based on my experience because I knew them, right? So I wanted to make sure that we did not lower the expectations from a university student's but we raise the expectations of our students. So essentially, we began that program and we designed the curriculum around ethnic studies, around uh, cultural uh, capital, racism, um, educational racism. I mean, these are all topics that they did not have the academic background in, but they had the life experience in. And so we designed our curriculum around that. And after about a month or two, they bought in because we began having conversations with them. We began teaching them how we teach our university students. We were not teaching them in the essentialist um, educational model. It wasn't sit at your desk, sit down, do your work, which is the common practice in juvenile hall. We, the first thing we did is we made our desks a circle. The second thing we did is we let our students know, you can speak up in here. And we taught them the idea of, of conversation. We taught them the idea of respectful debate respectful discussion. We made sure that they did not have to agree with everything that was being taught in that class. But we also made sure that if they were going to disagree or they were going to have input, it was going to be appropriate. It was not going to be like it, like it was, you know, the, their experiences that they've had thus far. 
And we had amazing results. That's the thing. We had amazing results. We had, oh, and in order to assess our students, I made sure that I did not give them a multiple choice test. I made sure that we did not give, you know, uh, we, we did not give short answer tests. You know, our students wrote essays for assessment. And I had to teach him academic essay structure. But that was, that was an easy challenge because their, their, their thoughts were already in their head. They just needed to know how to put them down on paper. Now, in order to do that, I had to let them know that the essay was the final task. They could, they could use anything available for them in order to get to that essay. So along the way, we realized that if we use an arts-based research methodology where, where we used visual assessments and then transition that to narrative ass assessments, that would be the most significant transition. So, and our students really found that when we told them that drawing a picture or taking a photograph or, or writing a poem or writing a short story was just as valuable in an assessment as a narrative or, and, and it actually we told them that it was more valuable than a multiple choice test. So the results were, were, were frankly, they were amazing because our students understood at that point what it was like to um, have a discussion, what it was like to have an academic discussion. And here's an example of, of Here's an example of when we we knew that our students were getting it. And, and when I say when I'm saying getting it, I'm not I'm not talking about they were they were absorbing the material that we were having a discussion with. They were getting it in the sense that they were becoming academics. We had a guest speaker one day. And the guest speaker ended her lecture and told them, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect when I came in here, but I was pleasantly surprised. And it seems like a normal, you know, comment, or it could be a normal comment. But one of our students raised his hand and, and he asked her, he said, can I ask you a question? And, and uh, she's like, sure. And he goes, well, what did you mean by that? And she looked at him and she goes, what do you mean? And he said, well, everybody that has come in here to lecture or to give a guest lecture has said the same thing. They were pleasantly surprised. What did you expect when you came in here? And at first, she was taken a little bit. She was taken aback a little bit. And everybody in the class was also taken aback because they all looked at the probation officer who was in the classroom because he was asking, him, it, it was like he was starting not to cross the line, but, you know, in there, they're not allowed to question, if you will. And so he questioned. But the probation officer, who really was one of the main supports in this particular program, looked around and said, that's a good question. And they had it. And then at that point, the guest lecture answered. And they had, and then they had a conversation of what do people expect when they go into to juvenile hall? And so once again, this idea of conversation, you know, began. And once they, and that was a pivotal point because at that point they understood that their voice was not going to be uh, oppressed. Their voice was not going to be squished down. And, and told that be, you know, and told and they weren't going to be told to hide their voice in their belly. They were allowed to express their thoughts, express their ideas. And to them, you know, and, 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 you know, with some of my conclusions, a lot of them looked forward to our class time because they quote unquote said, they, they said, quote unquote, 
those were the only times when we were locked up that we felt normal. So that's a huge hurdle. Now, right now we have of the cohort, we have uh, six students who are continuing to educate. Everybody from the cohort has been released now. Um, and of all the ones who have, you know, of all the cohort, or no, I'm sorry, everyone but one has been released. Of all the ones that, that, that have been released, uh, six are attending post-secondary institutions. So whether it's a junior college or continuing ed there, we have two who are, who are at universities. Um, and we have, well, actually, uh, we also have a third who's at a university, but he's going to seminary school um, here in Southern California. So he's studying at a university, but he's studying seminary because he wants to become a pastor. So, um, you know, we've, we've established, you know, quite a bit, quite a bit of success. Um, the other, the, the remaining have went on to two years and now they're in vocations. They're, essentially they're, they're working, they're working full time. Um, and so the attachments are really my discussions with them when they were released because I couldn't necessarily do, um, the the study as far as like the research part of it until they were released and, and, and my my conversations with them about that particular program. Um, but one of the first things that we did that, that I did ask them to do, I, I asked them, I go, I want you to take a picture of something, a photograph. And I gave them a camera and I said, I want you to take a a, a, a photograph of the first thing that you experience that has meant something to you after you were released. And then we had a discussion on how those photographs related to their time of incarceration. So, and so we, you know, we, we, I got amazing artwork. I got amazing photographs. Um, and we had amazing conversations. But what I found about this and, and, and what I found out is that those students who who went through this program, their perceptions of academia did change. The ones that continued on um, and the ones that completed um, academia or, or, you know, post-secondary once they were released, they were not afraid of college anymore. They were not afraid to to go to go to school anymore. They felt comfortable enough to pursue post-secondary education. Their perceptions did change. Now, I would love to see how this would look on a grand scale. I would love to, to do this in all juvenile halls across, you know, the West Coast and see and have, hopefully I'd have similar results. But I would theorize that that the results wouldn't be any different than they would be at a comprehensive. In fact, I, I think if we change the pedagogy in juvenile hall and in juvenile justice education, if we change the way those students are taught, we can definitely change their lives.